Welcome, my name is Jessica Dumas. I'm the chairperson for the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce and president of Jessica Dumas Coaching and Training. I want to first acknowledge that we are on Treaty One territory, home to the Ojibwe, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene nations and homeland to the Red River Métis. And again, welcome and thank you for joining the kickoff to the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce Small Business Forum. Four times a year, we come together to connect and hear from our local leading business experts to discuss and address the important issues that are facing your business today. Today's virtual event is hosted by two members of our Small Business Council, and I would like to introduce them to you. First, I'd like to welcome and introduce Carly Minish, who's the founder of SmackDab and is one of our Advisory Council co-chairs. Welcome, Carly, and I'd like to say welcome to Adam Dooley, President of Dooley PR and Marketing. I hope that you have a great event. I hope that you reach out and will stay engaged, and I hope that you will be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone, and welcome, and thank you so much for starting your day here with us. Uh, my name is Carly Menish. I am the founder of SmackDab, the co-chair for the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce's Small Business Advisory Council, and I am your co-host for today's Small Business Forum. And I'm Adam Dooley, president of Dooley PR and Marketing, a member of the Small Business Advisory Council and Carly's counterpart for today's program. For those of you who might not know, the Small Business Advisory Council is a group of small business owners from a bunch of different sectors. We work with the Winnipeg Chamber to help shape things like their advocacy efforts and events programming. Our role is to bring forward issues and views that are important to Winnipeg small business community. So that means we get to put together some really fun, engaging, informative events like today's. And where our goal is to not only give you access to experts, who can help you elevate your business, but also give you access to each other for an opportunity to network, make some new connections, and also learn from other local business owners. Although we cannot gather in person for a while, we are excited to offer you this new virtual small business forum experience where you can still visit member booths and network one-on-one -on -one with each other and members, but still enjoy a keynote session. For those of you who joined us uh, last week in our virtual luncheon, you've already experienced this new platform. But for those of you that are new, we're just going to give you a little brief overview. Yeah, that's right. An another an unprecedented overview. Everything is unprecedented these days. So today's virtual programming is set up to reflect your in your usual in person forum experience. For example, as you logged in today, you hopefully saw the networking tab on the left side where uh, you can enter one-on-one -on -one video sessions with other attendees. Or if you prefer, you can visit the many different member booths by clicking on the Expo tab. That's, I think, down there somewhere. Um, or maybe you have a client you want to connect with or a prospect you want to meet. Well, now is your chance. Just like at an in-person event, all you have to do is scan the room, tap them on the shoulder. The only difference is that today you're doing it virtually from the comfort of your office or home. So if you're looking to tap someone on the shoulder, I think that's over here on the right side on the people list. And you can just click on them and send them a private message. These are just a few of the features we have available for you to connect and grow your network all from your home or office. If you have any technical issues today, please contact any of our chamber staff or volunteers through chat on the right hand corner or right hand side. And they are listed as WCC help under the people list. So before we get uh, going with our keynote here, which we're very excited about, I just want to send a big thank you to our small business sponsors, uh, BDC, KPMG, Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan, and of course, RBC. Yeah, many thanks to our sponsors. They're all huge supporters of our small business community here in Winnipeg. We encourage you to get on social media today. Uh, join the conversation using the hashtag WCC Small Biz. That's WCC Small B I Z. We'll be jumping into our keynote with Dr. Bill Howitt shortly, but before we do, I want to explain how today's forum is going to work. The first half will be a keynote presentation from Dr. Bill Howitt, followed by a brief Q&A with Dr. Howitt, led by me and Carly. And uh, for the final portion of today's program, you as an attendee will be joining two breakout sessions with approximately five other members. If we're meeting in person, you'd be breaking up into a group, uh, into the group you have at your table, but this is a virtual version of that. Your virtual breakout sessions are a chance to meet a few other attendees, and together you can debrief and discuss predetermined topics 
surrounding today's discussion. So stay tuned. We'll, be, uh, we'll provide more detailed instruction after the keynote. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about Dr. Howitt. So Dr. Howitt believes that thriving employees are the foundation of a thriving business. Today, Dr. Howitt is going to speak about developing your mental fitness, a topic that is so relevant and significant to the times we are in right now. I think we can all agree that. Most of us have something happening in our life that is a distraction or a concern. The frequency and intensity of the stress can negatively impact our mental health and happiness. That is why Dr. Howitt created the FIT model to help people who are feeling stuck in one part of their life to move from fear to flourishing. So to, in today's webinar, he will combine a unique blend of personal and professional experiences to share what he learned that helped him move through one of his biggest personal life challenges. Dr. Howitt is also the author of a book called Stop Hiding and Start Living, and we're going to hear more about that in a second. Yeah, and I think we're all getting a copy of that, if I'm not mistaken, which is really fantastic. I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to it. We're really, we're really excited to be joined today by Dr. Howitt. He's the founder and president of Howitt Consulting and the chief of research and workforce productivity at the Conference Board of Canada, leading the board's applied research programs in workplace wellness, mental health, and workforce productivity. We hope you enjoy Dr. Howitt's presentation. Take it away, Bill. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much. We're in the land of technology. I'm in my apartment in Ottawa today. It's a beautiful day. It's like, I think it's about 20 some Celsius out there. And I think there's not gonna to be too many of these left. So I'm gonna enjoy it as much as I can. All right, so what I'm gonna do is have a conversation with you around mental health. We're gonna talk for about 30, 35 minutes. I'm gonna introduce you to the concept around uh, what's called a fit model, which Carly introduced you to. And that's a part of how, what I really wanna do is be able to unpack how I came to this. And, and I think, that which will be helpful for you is to give you a little bit of context around why I created this book. And one of the things that's important for you to understand is that I've spent pretty much my entire adult career working in the area of mental health. And I work very, very closely with uh, Louise Bradley, the CEO of the Mental Health Commission. I work closely with large organizations, medium organizations, small organizations. Uh, I used to own small businesses in a small community. We had uh, two Gold Crown Hallmark stores. We had around 20 employees. And the challenges of dealing with mental health in a small business. And one of the things I'm trying to do is I start to do things to start to make things accessible to try to give people a frame of reference. Now, to, I could spend a lot of time talking to you about my academics. I've seen patients for over 30 years. I'm going to briefly give you three lenses and why. And, and so that you can get some context of how I formed this book. And I wanna walk you through the, the journey of the book in the context of being healthy around mental fitness, that concept to introduce it to. See one, I, like I said, I spent 30 years seeing patients. I have a PhD in counseling psychology and I spent a long time, started out in forensic and worked in that area. I went in the academic world. I did work in colleges and university and I did teaching. I worked in Wall Street in 12 years as in large financial organizations as his chief of staff and a chief operating officer. So I have experience of being a business owner myself for over 30 years. Lots of them, I have my own team now, Howard HR, and we have a small business, we have about 10 employees as well. And so one of the challenges of being a small business is making things accessible and providing folks with a frame of reference of what mental health is versus mental illness. I'm gonna be spending my time talking to you about mental health. And I'm gonna speak through through a personal lens because this book is really about my life story in regards to how I actually figured out how to get to where I'm at now. And I didn't do that alone. I did that because of mentors and because of opportunity. I'm the kid who grew up in Halifax and lived in the foster home for a bit and then was adopted and then went to Prince Edward Island where I was raised. My mother and father, my father was a bartender for 50 years, really amazing values. It was a really safe place for me to go. But my challenge was when I was got into the public education system, I uh, failed grade two, and you may not have had that experience. And a part of this book is going to be walking you through how I came up with a fit model, because a lot of it's around my story around failing grade two, and what happened to me. And I'll give you some stories throughout this journey to make it relevant. And, and, and why I'm where I'm at today is because I had mentors and opportunities because when I went through the public education system, I was failing it pretty much every day. And I was forming the belief system, I may never learn how to learn. 
I, but as I go through it, I'll talk about different stories that got me to where I was. But then I'm going to share with you a couple of significant events as I walk through my talk about how I learned how to learn. See, my belief system is, is that we all have certain challenges in life. And one of the challenges with mental fitness is you may not have a frame of reference. So if I said to you what the algorithm is for physical health, you would probably go, okay, I know what that is. That's exercise, diet, rest, relaxation. Oh, and lifestyle choices. You see, if we drink too much or we do drugs too much or we gamble too much or we eat too much food, those things can create what the illusion of symptom relief. But over time, if we don't pay attention, they can actually, those at-risk behaviors can develop their own problems for us. And what happens for us is that if I said to the average person, I said, did I say anything you didn't know about? And they go, yeah, okay. Did you know if you do all that, you reduce your risk for chronic disease? And they go, yeah. But did you know you need to do things with intention to actually reduce? Like I have a machine out over my shoulder, one of these steppers. Did you know if you buy those things and you put them in your house and you get on them once, you do not get shredded? Did you know that? meaning I actually have to get on that machine with intention. I, if I wanted to make some lifestyle choices, I drink a little bit more water, a little bit less caffeine. I drink water versus drink is pop. Life is about making micro decisions for physical health. Now, if I said to you what the algorithm is for mental health, some of us actually don't understand that mental health is different than physical health, or sorry, mental health is different than mental illness is because mental health is very much like physical health, what we do with intention to be able to help us how we can actually interact with the world. See, your mental health is really your lens. You see, you may or may not know what your genetic set point is. You may not know that your happiness of you as a human being is 40% of it's in your control, 50% of it's genetic, and 10% of it's your environment. You may not know from a neuroplasticity perspective that every day you have between 12 and 50,000 thoughts. And, and sadly, for lots of us, they're negative. You may not know that whenever you have a difference between what you want and what you have, and you can't solve it here in your broker's region, then you can't solve outside. You start to solve emotionally. And when we get caught in our emotions, you may not know that automatic thoughts can jump up. And those automatic thoughts are just thoughts, but they're not facts. If we start believing those, that can start putting us at risk. So what happens is when people get trapped in their head, that can create like Roger Bannister talked about a morphogenetic feel like that can kind of hold us when we're trapped. So my story that I'm going to talk to you about is that I don't believe that all of us have the frame of reference to help us be mindful of things that we can do to support our mental health. If I do anything in this short talk is to give you a few ideas about how the model works and some ideas of your life that you can do to be able to improve. And the purpose of this is all around promoting mental health because mental illness is on one axis and mental health is on another axis. I have patients that come to me with very severe mental illness, but once we can ameliorate the symptoms, they can have really, really good mental health, but they still have that chronic issue. We need to make sure we protect them, that they do their work to maintain. Very much if I'm a diabetic, I might be a type two diabetic or type one diabetic, but I have good health, but I have to manage it. So part of it is, is that the challenge is for a lot of small businesses, they may not get accessibility to all these big strategic HR programs. And what I'm trying to get people to realize mental health is about awareness. What mental health, what employers can do, small, medium, large, is start to have conversations with their employees about what mental health is and to realize that, that each and every one of us have to understand that we need to do something to own our mental health. And when I go through my story briefly, you know, I'm the person who's sitting here talking to you that, you know, I have some background in academics, I have some work, but I lived my entire life with a mental illness. I've lived with anxiety my entire life, and I will talk about other conditions as I go through my, my story to give you a frame of reference. So to help you get your head around what this FIT model is, is that my belief system is, is that all of us have five areas that we're trying to manage daily. And imagine you had 10 brain units. I know you have more than that, but imagine you had 10 brain units. Well, each and every day, if you think about how many brain units do I spend thinking about money or education or my career or my relationships or my physical health my, or my mental health? Well, I find it fascinating that 
Lots of people spend probably six to seven percent of all their 60 to 70 percent, sorry, of all their brain units focused on money and career. So that means they only have two or three brain units left for their relationships and are chronic conditions like offsetting that. You think about obesity is probably one of the top killers in our planet. Mental health by 2030, they expect to be the number one cause of premature death. So if you start to think about it, it kind of makes sense if you scratch your head and go, okay, so if people are spending most of their time focused on having their job, what's happening is that lots of people doing their job and money may not realize that they started out with some health, but they focus on wealth, and at the end of it, they don't have any health. And I see this happen all the time, where lots of people go through their entire career, they want to get a pension, and by the time they get to 60, they spend the, most of their life managing their conditions. And so what the frame is, is we can help people become mindful of how their mental health is actually a filter that will influence what we do and be able to become aware of the things that we can do to actually positively impact our outlook can give us more sense of autonomy and sense of control. See, mental health doesn't have to be super, super complicated. Yes, the environment, bad things happen to us. Like for example, you know, I'm sitting here in Ottawa. My mother died a few weeks ago. I'm sitting here, I'm gonna talk with you and I talk to other people, I do it all the time. I have pretty good mental health but I'm still grieving the loss of my mother. But the fact is, is I'm aware of what's happening with my mental health and I can pay attention to micro skills that I can do. If I don't know what's happening to me, then I'll be caught in my emotions. And then I'm kind of caught in stress and then I feel trapped. And that's what happens when people live with mental health issues. So the FIT model is that most of us, and you're gonna to start to realize that we all have these effort moments. But the reality is for me, when you start to see the nuances of what we're doing in the book, the effort moment means that for whatever the reason, why is it sometime that people are in a relationship for 20 years and all of a sudden they wake up one morning and go, I've had enough? Or why is it someone was smoking for years and says, all of a sudden I've had enough? Those effort moments, that spontaneous remission, where we make decisions that are healthy for us, those are magical, but they're hard to actually, actually generate on demand. What my, what I, my concept here is to help facilitate those moments is to have a fit model that can produce us, it gives us a framework to start to deconstruct different challenges in different areas of our life. So, and as you go through this, thinking about, I will share some of my story. However, for you, what areas of your life would you like to see improved? Because there's a direct interaction between our life experiences. We know, for example, Right now in Canada with the pandemic, there's been some major changes and challenges for small businesses and large business and medium across our country. We know the number one and number two, number two predictor of mental health right now in Canada is having a job and being able to pay your bills right now. We just finished a study I was leading with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and we just found that, there, that the average Canadian has an 84% increase in level of concern. So this whole idea around mental health is becoming important. So this story that I'm going to talk about, this is my story. And my, it's not meant to say that, my, that I'm special or I have any special power. I'm just gonna share as a kid that grew up in the Maritimes, some ideas that I learned that helped me. And because of my clinical background and my academic background, I realized as I became older that I went through a process and I've replicated the same model in different parts of my life that I know it works and I use it with clients, I know it works. So it resulted in writing the book about it. And we know that lots of us are gonna have this thing called bad stress. That's the difference between what you have and what you want. And as much as we as human beings want to stop stress, what, the part that we often don't realize is that happiness is not binary. You're not happy, you're not sad. There's a gray area. The Dalai Lama will tell us that misery is just no different emotion for us than happiness. For whatever the reason, of course we would want more happiness in our lives, but misery is nothing more than a emotion. It doesn't mean it's good, bad, or indifferent. It's just sometimes life can be challenging. And as those hard moments come, they pass. And as good moments come, as they pass. What the part that stops us sometimes is how stress can actually, when they get us in that part of our brain, it's important for you to realize that, that we get stuck here. So a quick metaphor to remember is the car metaphor. If I went out to try to start my car and I couldn't start it, I reasonably ought to know myself 
after driving for near 40 years that that car is probably broken. And I get, it's what I do, I don't know if you do, I go around, I open up the hood, I go inside, I look at it, create the illusion, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then after I look at it amply enough to look like I've done something, then I put the hood down, I call CAA, CAA, CAA sorry, and I get uh, some help. What's important for you to be aware of is what happened there. What's the, what's the moral of the story? The moral story is just because I don't know that there's an answer doesn't mean there's not an answer. What I try to get people to realize when you're in a pretty good state, just because something in your life happens overwhelming, just because you don't know the answer doesn't mean there isn't because in the absence of hope, human beings have nothing. And that's important for us to remember. And we, we need to talk about these things like suicide and different things is that they just don't happen to people who, that, that like the, everyone else. Suicide thoughts can happen to anybody. And what happens for us is we're not aware of what's happening to us. Our world can kind of sink in. So what we want to do is give people a frame of reference to realize that if you have one or more areas of your life that is giving you a challenge, it's those things can actually be the things, stressors that bring us down. Now, Kennedy, one of, candidly, one of the hardest things about being a human being is getting along with other human beings. There's probably no other task harder than getting along with other people. Now, some people are awesome at it, and some people struggle at it, and all the rest of us fall in the middle of it. So if you have some area of your life that's creating some challenge, what's interesting is you may not know it, you might create what's called the Roger, like Roger Bannister talked about, you know, breaking the four minute mile. Well, most human beings didn't know there was a morphogenetic field that no one believed the four minute mile could be broken until Roger Bannister broke it. And then they believed they could do it. If we get rules in our head, that can paralyze us and hold us, we may believe that we're never gonna be fit. No, we could never be married. We could never be happy. Well, we could never get another job or we get up. These rules in our head often are anchored in fear. And so what'll happen is for the purpose of this talk today, what I'd like you to do is pick one area that you want to focus on. Cause I'm gonna introduce you briefly to the model and then we'll go through it and I'll talk a little bit for the next 15 minutes or so, and then what'll happen is we'll take some questions. So, and, and what I really want you to be aware of when you see this model is to get your mind thinking about a concept. If I have one area in my life in those five levels that I want to impact, there's a process we go through. The process is not linear. So the story where I'm gonna to start to give you context of how this model works with me is I'm the kid, as I suggested to you, went, to the public education system and I failed grade two. Now you may not have had that experience, but when all the other kids go ahead of you and you're caught in the public education system, you're feeling stupid. The thing for me is my biggest fear was I would never be able to learn. I wasn't stupid. I could see other kids learning. I couldn't do what they were doing. So I was caught in a cycle where I was failing every day and going back in fear that this cycle. So I was caught in this loop of fear and failure. If I didn't have my mom and dad as role models, I wouldn't be able to go where I'm at. Now, what's happened is, is I wanna give you an introduction to how the book will give tools to help a person move through fear into failure into focus. But it's important for you to also realize that any part that you want to start in your life doesn't always always start fear. You might have some area in your life where you're not fearful. Yeah, you're not too worried about failing. Your challenge is you haven't made it a priority to focus on and finish and then flourish. Exercise and diet and nutrition happen to lots of people. It's not fear and failure. It's just making themselves and valuing themselves and making themselves as important as the other things in their life. Health requires intention. And unless we actually have some objective attention. So as we go through this, fear comes in all degrees. So mine was being that young kid who failed, thought he was gonna be stupid. And how we cope with fear will decide how we move forward. Some people shut down. Some people actually for fear, they try to numb the pain. They go to food, alcohol, drugs. But the thing about fear is we need it. It actually protects us. But what, what really sucks is when we're paralyzed in fear and there's no intimate danger, it's in our head. 
and we get caught in our head, then we can almost get caught in suspended animation. I know because I've had the privilege to work with human beings for so long, is I have had people who break up in a relationship and they may not go near another person for four or five years. And it's not because they didn't want to. It's because they were fearful no one would actually accept them or fearful that whatever was going on in their head, they got stuck. And as they got stuck, the spring went by, the summer went by, the fall went by, the winter went by, spring's here. And what's happened is they got into this cycle where they started to actually feel trapped. And then those negative emotions become all consuming and they can become problematic. And one of the byproducts of fear is that can paralyze any hope that we're going to get from point A to B. And it, that emotional pain, I said, we'll cope. The challenge with fear is when it blinds me and I don't see any potential to be able to get from A to B, that can actually reduce my risks for ever wanting to deal with it. And you'll see people will actually leave that. And you'll see that often with people, for example, in marriages are really, really lonely and they don't fearful because they don't want to stay and they don't want to break up. They, they feel they're caught financially. They stay in their relationship and then they distract themselves uh, because they're fearful they'll never have anything there. And then they get them, so then they throw themselves in the work or they throw themselves in their community or throw themselves somewhere else because they don't, they're fearful. They don't know what to do with this. And they don't have any idea, but what's cool about this, if I identify my relationship or my work, whatever the issue is, if I identify and I have fear, but realize moving through fear, I must have hope that I have to be able to see the destination. So for me, I did not actually believe I had any hope at all. When I, until I met my angel in grade five, when this particular teacher said to me, say, hey, Bill, I know you have had a hard time. You failed grade two and grade three was hard and you had to do twice. And, but in grade five is a new thing. And we, we, I think you, you, know, you could do really good here. She was just like an angel. And she said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, how about we write a book? So I couldn't read a book, so why not write a book? That makes sense, doesn't it? So we wrote a book called Our Trip to Warren's Grove. And what happened was for me, those two weeks to write one paragraph with my mom and going through the fear of getting it done and failing and fear. But once I started to focus and started to actually see that something happened, I started to get some hope. And when I actually submitted and it made the book and I saw the book printed and I saw it and I said, oh my God, I could potentially do it. That grade five got me to grade eight where I had another experience. Grade 10 had another experience. But my whole life changed when I had to go to university because I've got there as a pretty good football player, as a bigger kid. And when I got to Acadia, I met one particular professor who gave me one conversation that said to me, said, Bill, how did you get to Acadia? And I said, you know, I'm pretty sure by bus. And she said, that's not what I'm asking you. How did you get in? And when we went through it, she didn't judge anybody. She just said, here, here's what we're going to do. You know, we accepted you. Now we're going to create an accommodation. We're going to create a plan for you and you're going to learn and we're going to teach you. And I'm not, I was going to leave this year, but I'm going to hang around, help make sure this all works. And to her word, then all of a sudden, I was now starting to see a glimmer of hope for the first time. I was mature enough that now she helped me put names to it. So now she named, I had auditory visual dyslexia. She explained to me what that meant. I had visual dyslexia. She explained what that meant. I was ADHD. She explained what that meant. And I had anxiety because I felt I was so, and for years, I still am hypervigilant because of, my, of how I've had to deal with things over the time. And so what happens is we go through this process, how, how moving out of fear is accepting that fear is normal and that anything in life we want to get through, is, there's, we have to realize there is no shortcut. Like we are an allopathic society looking for pills and quick fixes. And, that, and sadly, de dealing with ourselves, what the challenge is, is that we need to allow ourselves to realize if it's not intimate danger, is that it's okay to not know all the answers, but as long as we can have the supports and that environmental supports key to be able to see the plan. And then fear doesn't limit us. And we can start moving and realizing we can move out, move out of this, these situations. And as you move out of fear and allow yourself like I did to start to fail. So when I went to Acadia, 
that was wonderful for me because now I was allowing myself to fail like riding a bike and falling off the bike and getting the learnings without thinking I was just a completely idiot. Before I was judging myself, filling that emotional bank here of all that internal dialogue was creating really negative scripts for me. But now that I was failing, I was realizing through the process, failure is not an enemy. I was learning what was working, what I couldn't, and we're building my accommodation. And I was moving out of learned helplessness to actually learning that it was okay. And as I started to do that, when you start to, you, I started to challenge my internal rules. I started to tame my feel of failure. And I started to realize that failing takes place when I'm doing, and it's okay to allow it. And I was no, I was no longer in a fake failing part where, you know, you know, I was allowing myself to realize I was actually really there, allowing myself to try. And as I moved through failure, I realized that some days were good and some days were bad. And one day can be easy, one can be hard. And realize that, that once I started in my head to associate, there are no panaceas, there are no shortcuts. What did I do for Acadia? It's pretty clear, people that know me, what, what I did. I played football, I, I went to school, I learned, did my extra work, and I worked. And that's all I did. I create, they created discipline for me as ADHD person. They gave me structure, they gave me what I needed. And I knew if I worked really, really hard, things, good things would happen. And I realized I didn't have to be perfect. A key moment for me is when Dr. Little came to me and said, hey, Bill, you're starting, to, you're starting to do, you're doing better. There's something you need to know, son. I said, what's that? There's no expectation you'll ever be able to write a great, perfect sentence. You will never be able to do that. You can sit there and try and probably you'll never master it because of your eyes and how you hear and sound, you don't have any phonics. But he said, you got a lot of good stuff in your head and we know you're going to be able to do really well. So what we're going to do is you're going to have a professional editor. You need someone to edit your content and then you can talk to them. So uh, that was like lifting a giant weight off me. Then I allowed my creativity because what an accommodation in Canada is, it's not about giving people a break. Accommodation is about removing barriers. Acadia removed a barrier for me. It's like a ramp. So if I'm in a wheelchair, a ramp removes a barrier. If I'm blind, I have, you know, technology help me or deaf. It, it, it's, this is when you're having mental health challenges, giving employees accommodations, not giving them excuses, giving them accommodations to be successful, but employees need to be able to articulate it. And I wasn't able to. So I had mentors that helped me learn how to articulate where I was. And as I started to go through this, I started to realize, okay, I can get out of this. And failure is a part of mastery. And then I realized, oh my God, I don't have to be perfect. Oh, by the way, there is nobody perfect. There is, there, perfection is, there doesn't exist. Now I've worked in Wall Street for 12 years and I saw lots of really super smart people to make mistakes. And so what I realized is that if I don't have to be perfect, I have to be good enough to be able to get my ideas out and do what I wanted. And what happened for me is that experience of Cadia helped me in that area that when we're talking about education, you know, that pillar, I wanted to get an education because I was told I was going to be a good firm hand in grade two. Now, not that there's anything wrong with being a firm hand, but I was told that in grade two, that, you know, school, you're, not, you're, you're just not going to be able to get through it. And that's what you're going to do. And, and they, in fact, they even try to tell my parents that he's, just, he's never going to be able to really do much. Now, back in the early 70s, they, talk, they said some stuff to students, I'm sure, that probably weren't the most appropriate. And so when I, if I can remember that in my mid-50s, those lines, that probably was a pretty significant emotional event for a young person. Words matter. What we say to people matter. You see, words are like taking a nail to, to a board. You bang the nail on the board, you take the nail out, but the hole's still in the board. And we need to be careful to the words we say to ourselves and the words we say to others. But for me, what I realized is once I was saying, I got fear of failure, I started to focus. The power of focus, requiring attentions to overcome, I was able to start to focus. And focus promotes you to have a sense of control. And that gives you purpose. Focus gives you energy and gives you purpose. And when you start to have something, you think about the person who said, one day I'm going to run a marathon. And I go, well, you never ran a marathon. All of a sudden they start focusing. Or they said, I'm going to really get serious about something. You start focusing your attention on it. Then you start to accept the micro decisions we make give us control. 
And what we have to realize, like any goal setting thing to get from A to B, we don't have to be perfect. We only have to be focused and we do things 90% of the time, like a protractor you from A to B, we'll get to where we need to go. And that was the purpose of this is to help people get to the point where they would have an opportunity to be successful. And for me, I realized that if I paid attention and followed my plan, I started to learn how to learn. And as I started to focus, the more I was focusing and my, and I, realizing that this was a priority. I made education a priority for me. I made that, I knew that that was a golden goose for me. I knew there was parties, I knew there was all of, but my father put really strong values on me and that thing called, he said, dad taught me integrity is what you do when no one is watching. He said to me, son, what do you want to do? I said, I want to learn how to, I want to learn. He said, well, parties and all that stuff will be there for you later. And that's what I did. And when I focused on that, it gave me the ability there's no substitute, it's not complicated. I started to get some success. And when you start focusing on things, then you start finishing. And finishing gives you that idea around conviction, competency, and you start to realize you can start cope more because that gives you mental agility because you realize you start winning. So now I'm in that area of my life, I'm starting to get more fit. You see how the fit model is starting to work now. I'm, I'm, I went from fear, and I went to failure, I started to focus, now I'm starting to finish, now I'm starting to get like, okay, now I can actually do this thing. And I'm starting in my head to start to realize. And what happened for me, when I graduated my first degree at Acadia, I sat back and I looked at someone, I said, this was kind of a fluke. So, and I, so I had to figure out my own mind, I wanted to do one more degree, I said. So I went back to playing my fifth year football, and my only way I was allowed to do it is my dad said, yeah, you have to get, you have to graduate again though. So I had to figure out how to get another degree in my fifth year, which took a lot of work. So, and, and what happened was, is I started to realize I could finish my education and started to believe in my own learning. I started to realize that was charging my battery. See, learning used to be a great big dream. It was amazing. The thing that was the hardest thing in my world for me started to become a charger. I started to actually start to realize that that for me was an energy booster because it was starting, I was starting to finish. And I knew that I still, like I couldn't be partying all the time. I knew my training for football was awesome for me because it gave me discipline. I knew I had to sleep, had to eat, had to lift, I had to run, I had to go to my classes. Having it, that really was structure was amazing for me particularly. And so as I started to realize finishing, I realized I needed to keep my charge. And, 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 and because for me, I was finding it exciting, I was getting charged by doing it. And, and what I needed to realize is that we still, though, is as well as prepared as I was, cognitive hygiene, I still needed to be mindful that some days negative thoughts can jump in your head and they can kind of say, you know, like something you're having a hard day. So example, I remember one time in my third year, I failed a couple of tests and I was just couldn't get something. I was thinking, oh my God, it's happening. And, and then what happened was, of course, my mentor said, you know, you have to focus on what you, we can learn. And you sitting there feeling and thinking, saying these things to yourself are not going to be helpful because that's just going to take you back to where you were. And because I had mentors who were helping me being mindful that your thoughts create your reality. So if I was allowing these negative thoughts to create my reality, what was happening is I was empowering parts of my brain because all these thoughts were just thoughts. And I wouldn't have come to this on my own. I would have been caught here and I probably would have given up a few times. But because I had people saying, hey, this makes normal that you're gonna get caught. So then I realized I had to practice my own. And by going through this, I realized that life is about making good decisions the same good decisions over and over and over and over. And I wish there was a mat, like, it's like having a loving, caring marriage is doing the little things. Having loving, caring children is doing things with your kids. Enjoying your job is doing things. Like it's, it's interesting how we, when we start sometimes things seem so good, but if we stop doing the little things, things can get harder. That's a lot of how life is. It's about doing the little things with intention. And if we start finishing and we start to value what we is, what's happening, then we move into flourishing. And that's really what the point of the book is about, 
as you if it because you're going to get an opportunity to get the book and that part of it is to walk you through a year area of your life that you want to start to flourish because my belief system is all of us in those five levels of if you think about money career relationships our physical health and our mental health everybody i've ever met has one area in their life that's a dream and if they made the decision to want to take and focus on that they might be able to improve it here's the cool thing you don't always have to do the fear step by yourself i didn't so patients have come to me for years that even though they don't have a mental illness but it's impacting their quality of life and they, they're functioning in their dreams and sometimes we call it coaching and sometimes other people will call it therapy depending on what you're doing people come to me for therapy and sometimes executives for coaching but it's those blocks that stop them where it's a career block i could never become a ceo here or i could never be lovable there or i don't like myself one of the challenges with being human beings we don't give ourselves self-acceptance and we like who we see in the mirror it's really hard to actually have the experience that we want to. And, and, and knowing when you do these kinds of concepts, nothing's a God in the box. But what I wanted to try to give people is a, is a five steps with clarity. If I focus on, there's a process and you'll go through a process and you might slip. You think about people who lost 30 pounds and lost their focus and they go back and they feel like you're failing again. And then they might get stuck in fear where I'll always be this versus realizing there's a road if they choose to follow it. I wish I could say there's an easy road and a magic road, but there's not. There's a, there's a pragmatic and there's an objective road. Being a human being, waking up 365 days a year, dealing with a pandemic, dealing with all this stuff that we have, it's going to be challenging. And what happens is, is because we're such a resilient species, and if we can just give ourselves a break and some self-compassion, a little bit of awareness that we can, all of us can start flourishing, but becoming obsessed with it is probably not the way to go. For my story, to give you context of what I went through in my journey, I, like I, when I went through it, if you would have said to people in high school that I, this guy named Bill was gonna end up with eight degrees and a postdoctorate, they probably wouldn't believed it. If you would have said to people, he's gonna publish over 50 books and over 500 articles, they probably wouldn't believed it. And so what happens is, it's because I was able to learn how to learn. And then people said to me, said, well, why did you do so much education? Were you obsessed by it? I said, maybe, perhaps, because it took me a little bit of time so once I learned, was learning how to learn, I got so excited. It wasn't anymore about getting degrees. It was for me, and which I might be different, it was about me getting knowledge. The fact that I could actually start to obtain knowledge and start to get insights, that really started to charge my battery. Learning for me and writing for me has become the thing, my best therapy I've ever done. And, and to sit back and think that I spent 13 years of my life in a public education system where I was in pure pain for the process, thinking I would, you know, if I didn't make the CFL at the end of it, I thought, my God, if she's over, I'm going to be back doing labor somewhere. And again, not that that's a bad thing, but I had a dream. I had a dream from being a little kid because I was in a foster home and things happened to me I wasn't happy with, that I wanted to get myself in a position where I could help other human beings. And I had that from a little boy. And so what happened was I held that and I, and I realized that if we have a, have a purpose and have a focus, mental health is about mindfully doing things with intention. And we don't need to actually um, live in as much stress as we do if we can chunk it down. Like for example, if we're flourishing, and flourishing is often about doing little things. This might sound really simple, what I have on, but it isn't interesting if you do the little things like if you're if your money you want to pay off your debt each month and career you want to have you know keep your project management like my team meets with me every morning and we kind of frame out what we're going to do and and, and they know it's for my ADHD because I need structure relationships you know how what are you going to do I find lots of people sometimes get lost where they forget what the most important thing is I'll give you a hint. At the end of the day, human beings want to be with human beings. It's not with money. And so what we need, if we can do something, the, those authentic connections that we build 
the more we can help people build uh, meaningful relationships, that can really help support their mental health and can mitigate risk for isolation. You know, physical health, mental health, all these things that we can do. And as you're going through this, you know, a couple of things before we take some questions of a couple is it's really important that you, when you listen to someone like me, that it doesn't come off that what I'm trying to say is super impossibly hard or super, super easy. What happiness requires is intention. Now, you may not know that your genetic set point for happiness is your default when you don't have noise. So when we find calm, those days where you, all of a sudden you feel a big wave of happiness comes over, you're feeling great. That's where we want to be at. But many of us don't realize we have a 98-2 theory. We focus 98% of the time uh, our life is on the 2% that's not working good. And the 98% that's going really good in our life, we sometimes don't appreciate. Like when you woke up this morning about, you know, how lucky we are to have the quality of air we have and, you know, the infrastructure, the safety, and the quality, like all this stuff might sound, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? When you, those 5 million people in Canada during the pandemic that lost their job, and that may or may not got back yet. And maybe there's a starting, the small businesses are just, well, I'm gonna tell you, that was really real for them. And so if you're privileged enough to have a job and have finance and have caring, having support, it requires us paying attention to doing the little things. And that's, in my essence, one of the things I'm trying to teach people is that staying fit, flourishing, is to be mindful that it's not about perfection, only you can define what parts, what flourishing means. What flourishing means, you feel satisfied, you feel comfortable and happy. And mental health is about being happy or actually not so much, it's actually being satisfied with your station in life, being com comfortable. So if you're comfortable with your money, comfortable with your career, comfortable with your relationships, comfortable with your physical health, comfortable with your mental when we get to that point those are the happy campers those are the people who smile and they roll because though because that's your mental health is how you interact and process with the world and i don't believe we spend enough time realizing that it does, it's not like a flu the challenge is we can catch negative emotions from people like a cold so if you're around negative people yeah you can catch those like a cold and be negative without realizing why. The cool thing about mental health is when we realize that we have a lot of control and the fit model is about us intentionally picking areas of our life, one at a, at area of our life at a time and starting to put it in action. And, and you can take yourself and you can look at anywhere you want to in your journey, but it's consciously your turn to think about it. And if you want to look at your fit, all you need to do is take a kind of a, a grid like this and take it say is there any area in your life with money you're struggling in it might be debt where do you feel you're at career your job satisfaction or career or money or like when we take it and what many of us will have is have more than one area and what I tell people is pick just one and focus on it and it, and take some time to see you make some progress when we're able to do that we can have some pretty, pretty good thoughts. So I, I, I know it's a lot in a short period of time. I want to be respectful of the process of keeping these things pretty short. So I'm going to open it up now to uh, Carly and Adam to ask some questions. So give the re audience a couple ideas to try to give some context to this. Thank you so much for sharing. I can't stress enough, Adam, you'll probably agree how suitable this is in the time we're in. Like this talk is just so relevant to what a lot of people are going through and a lot of the entrepreneurs today. I was jotting down a bunch of notes while you were talking. So I've got, uh, I, I've got more questions <laughs> than we have time for. Oh, like, uh, Carly, do you want to kick it off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I had a question about, uh, I, first of all, one of my favorite things that you said was learned how to learn. I think that's a really short phrase, but I think it's really sweet. And it's just to the point that, mental health is a constant learning that we all need to partake in. I think that I, and I appreciate that mental health has become so much more of a talked about subject mm -hmm. and how it's not so hush hush that we can't talk about it. And 
we're more open about it. Cause I think that's so important, especially on the entrepreneurial world and business owners, because we have so much stress and anxiety and worry and fear. And, um, mm -hmm. I think it's just so good to talk about it. But my one question I had, um, was how do we implement this in the workplace? So I, I have a small team myself, but how do we start implementing a few strategies with our team that encourages, encourages mental fitness? What could you, what, what sort of advice could you have to anyone out there that has a small team that wants to start little implementations and little daily intentions? I, you know, I think it, it actually it's interesting you say that. So one of the biggest ones is actually just start with a, a simple conversation saying, you know something, I met, I was thinking about mental health and, I, and I'm wondering what we could start to do as a team to start to talk about mental health because I, I'm not talking about mental illness, mm -hmm. about, about us being broken or anxiety. It's those issues I want to hear and then maybe we can get off and get support like the, you know, my or EAP or if you don't have that, there's a wellness together portal, which the federal government have now that every Canadian get access to mental health support. So. One of, the, one of the things is start talking about mental fitness and talk through the context. And one thing you can really say is say, what do you do with, the, with when you do it deliberately, it charges your battery. You give them a frame, like when you do it and it's healthy and it feels really good. Like for example, myself, I just bought a, he's not here today, I would show him because he, he's a, uh, bought a little, uh, an English bulldog. So he said 12 weeks old. Now he's gone off to puppy school for the week. He's doing his PhD in puppiness apparently. And, and so he goes for a week and, uh, and he's up with some master trainers because I want him to be a service dog for my, for me. It's like, in other words, go over where I go. And, and so what's interesting is, is for me is every time I sit and have a conversation with that little bulldog as it was weird as it sounds, I actually get a warm feeling at church because he somehow helps me. I've always been a pet person. Pets calm me, but they also charge me. Exercise charges me. Doing things with my friends charge me. But I also do meditation and mindfulness and I've built my own mental fitness plan. The biggest thing to make it simple, Carly, just ask people to be really mindful of the three things. There are things we can do that are pro-social behaviors that are good for us, they charge our battery. There are things we do that are at risk coping and there's help seeking and just say that as a small organization, what we can do is talk about those pro social things we do, the charger battery. And, the, and if we're caught in fear, we can talk about that because you can talk about the fit model and you can give mm -hmm. people context, but we want to make sure people know it's not, we're not talking about therapy. We're talking about setting deliberate goals to improve the quality of my life. If someone gets caught up in at-risk behaviors like drinking or drugging, those, 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 that's outside our realm. We want to get them support. We want to encourage them to have help-seeking behaviors like the car metaphor. Just because you don't know the answer doesn't mean there isn't. So the simple part of this is that we got to stop thinking there's some great big script and a magic solution. We just need to start talking about it and allowing people to realize that we're all human beings and we're all like two meals away from revolution. Most, I mean, metaphor, I mean, you need to understand lots of us are just keeping it together. And so this whole thing is that the Delta between someone being super sane and not, it's not that big and we're in a pandemic, it's hard. And so what we want to give people hope is to realize we can do things. And the first one is to talk about it. You don't have to have the answers. You just got to be open about it and go, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And that just starts it. That's what will reduce stigma. However, Carly, one caution. If people start like an AA meeting and started saying, hey, you know, I have an anxiety or you know what, I was abused or like, that's not what we want. That's, that's outside your script because that'll create what potentially could create what's called ab reactions and counter transfer issues that could actually make the problem worse. Okay. You want to talk about things that like gym talk, like mental health, like things that you do that are good for your mental health. Mm -hmm. If they're talking about I'm at risk, suicide lines, 911, employers need to be there to say, I care for you, I'm there for you, but I'm not equipped to deal with this, but I'm equipped to support you. And lots of small businesses have to use, you know, EI, that 18 week benefit for employees that have issues with substance abuse or mental health. So they have time, they can have their job held if they need that help. Does that make sense? So make oh, a yeah, real clear sure. demarcation between prevention mm -hmm. 
an intervention in that. So you just stay up in the prevention, you'll be okay. Yeah, that's a great, thank you very much. That's a great answer. That's fantastic. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciate everything you said there. Sorry, Carly, go ahead. No, that's it. No, that's it. Um, I think we are out of time, unfortunately, though. Awesome. I, I, I think we could probably go on a lot longer, but we'll have to stop it there. Thank you so much, Dr. Howe. We really appreciate you coming on today and sharing so many. I like your personal experiences are really what's going to resonate with everyone here today. I know it resonated with me, so thank you so uh, thank much. Thank you so for much. Those. You guys were enjoyable to talk to, easy to talk to, and, and I really liked it. Amazing. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You guys take care of yourself. Keep up your good work. Bye-bye. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay, before we break into our roundtable breakout sessions, I just wanted to remind you about two upcoming events. Um, first, on Thursday, October the 8th, we'll be having our annual general meeting virtually. Registration is free and available online. And, uh, you know, we always need members to show up at the AGM, so please, uh, please take time to do that. That's fantastic. And then, oh, this is exciting. Uh, Thursday, October the 29th, we have our October virtual luncheon with Carrie Twig of Career Stories Consulting. I love Carrie Twig. She is amazing. If you don't know who she is, you will want to tune in. She is a bundle of energy and a fantastic mentor um, and guiding light for a lot of people on their own careers. Carrie was ranked one of the link, one of LinkedIn's top 10 voices. So, I mean, how many hundreds of millions of people are on LinkedIn? She's a Winnipegger. She's in the top 10. And uh, she's going to discuss how you can find, hone, and share your business story. Registration is free for members and available online. Awesome. So now it's time to do some networking and debrief on today's topics in our breakout sessions. So this roundtable is your opportunity to maximize this experience and debrief what you learned today and how you will apply those lessons moving forward in your business. So here's how it's going to work. On the left hand side, you will see a tab that says sessions, sessions under the stage tab. We have labeled the sessions uh, based on the most popular breakout session topics and please select an open room with the topic of your choice. You will have the opportunity to move between rooms halfway through the topic. Excellent. Um, I keep thinking of, we've got till age 63, Carly, till we max out our self-esteem. I'm really pumped about that stuff. That's good. <laughs> I guess That's I have really a little good. ways to go then. <laughs> I'm, I'm closer than you, but I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a spring in my step over that one. Um, each breakout room uh, will have an assigned facilitator to help navigate the conversation. If you're the facilitator, please encourage each attendee to do a quick introduction, go around the table. And from there, we ask you to discuss your topic amongst the group. Halfway through, we'll ask you that you move to a second available breakout room to discuss another topic and meet some new attendees. Uh, the rooms are capped at five members, so please join one that has availability. Um, once your second breakout session is done, you do not need to return to the stage. That'll be the end of the formal program. And don't forget, everyone who's attended will receive a free copy of Dr. Bill Howitt's new book, Stop Hiding and Start Living, How to Stay, how to, uh, say, hey, how to stay Fit to Fear and Develop Mental Fitness and that's coming in the mail to you. So please go ahead and click on the sessions button and join a breakout room. Happy networking and thanks very much for attending today.